People with serious mental illness die somewhere between 8 and 30 years younger than the general population. It becomes this, quote, red flag on the file where that clouds their judgment and they dismiss many of the physical symptoms that are happening and the causality of it as something purely as a manifestation of their mental illness. Before we dive into today's episode of the Mental Wellbeing College, an important disclaimer. We do dive into the weeds of mental health, which means that at times we discuss sensitive topics like suicide, self-harm and substance abuse. If hearing such discussion does bring up distress for you, please do seek the psychological and professional treatment that you need. The content covered in this episode is not intended as a substitute for professional mental health treatment. Hello everyone and welcome to our first ever 10 minute lifestyle psychiatry deep dive. These are short, digestible, applicable deep dives into the evidence on all things lifestyle psychiatry in about a 10 minute window that we're going to be doing fortnightly. If you're new to the show, I'm Indy Disanayake, a provisional psychologist here in Australia and a PhD candidate investigating the implementation of lifestyle-based interventions in mental health care. So let's dive into today's topic on the mortality gap scandal. The mortality gap scandal refers to the gap in lifespan between people with serious mental illness, so depression, bipolar, and schizophrenia, and the general population. That is, People with serious mental illness die somewhere between 8 and 30 years younger than the general population. And this isn't something we just see in low or middle income countries, but this mortality gap scandal persists even in high income countries like Australia, the US, Scandinavia. And suicide and accidental deaths only account for a very small percentage of the gap in lifespan between people with serious mental illness and the general population. Which begs the question, what's going on? So this gap is something that's been going on for many, many decades now. Going back as far back as the 1930s, the mortality gap has been reported between people with serious mental illness and the general population. And unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be getting any better. And in fact, some data says even report that the gap between people with serious mental illness and the general population in lifespan or mortality is actually widening. Yet, despite this, it just doesn't get that much media attention. And even in my own psychology graduate training, I wasn't taught about this once. I went through my whole training along with my fellow colleagues and was completely unaware that the very people that I was sitting in front of, the very clients who come to me for care, was unaware that they were actually dying decades earlier and that their health was so much more compromised on average than the general population. So suicide injuries and unnatural deaths only account for about a third of the deaths amongst people with serious mental illness. The big three drivers of premature death amongst people with serious mental illness and in this mortality gap are actually cancer, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes, preventable chronic diseases. It's just that people with serious mental illness are more likely to have these chronic diseases, one and a half to four times more likely to have cancer, cardiovascular disease, and or diabetes, and are dying earlier than people in the general population when they get them. So this really begs the next question. Why do people with serious mental illness have a higher incidence of these diseases, and why are they dying much younger? And The answer and the reality is it's very complicated, but there's a number of different factors which contribute to this mortality gap scandal. The first of which are lifestyle factors. So things like exercise, poor sleep, poor diet. So people with serious mental illness are much less likely to be meeting rates of physical activity, rates of recommended physical activity than the age match controls who don't have a serious mental illness. And there's a number of reasons why this might be. For example, if you have major depression, one of the really difficult things to do is your daily self-care activities from things like just brushing your teeth to getting out of bed to eating food can be really, really difficult and a core part of depression depending on your severity. So when you then look at exercising regularly, 
if getting out of bed is hard, imagine just how difficult it is for someone to go for a walk, go to the gym, go for a run on any sort of a regular or consistent basis. And this withdrawal is a really key part and core symptom of depression, along with what's called anhedonia, which is when you're doing things like exercise, for example, you're not able to feel pleasure or feel the level of happiness or contentment that someone without depression, you or I, for example, might feel when we exercise, and therefore you're less likely to do it. And it feeds into this negative reinforcing cycle of not doing these things, which becomes harder and harder to do, the more ingrained that pattern of behavior becomes. Then when we look at side effects of some medications, that can also make doing things like leading a physically active lifestyle much more difficult. So medication is the first line treatment in many different mental illnesses like schizophrenia, severe major depressive disorder or depression. But unfortunately, some medications do come with some side effects, things like weight gain, fatigue, difficulty sleeping, all of which can contribute to making it difficult to engage in any sort of regular exercise. And this can occur in more subtle ways as well. You know, I had a friend who was in the recovery phase of a psychotic related disorder that he was experiencing at the time. And being on antipsychotics, it was difficult for him to go to the gym or to exercise around other people because the particular antipsychotic that he was on caused a lot of central weight gain or causes kind of beer belly phenomenon around his abdominal area. And that caused a lot of self-consciousness around him, understandably so. So going to a gym, exercising when other people were around in the morning or after work was really out of the question for him as a, as a young male and made it difficult for him to get exercise. And as such, we would go for a walk at the local park in the middle of the day when it was a lot quieter together just as mates to help him get some exercise and, and for me to get some exercise. But that kind of gives you a bit of an insight as to what it's like and some of the more subtle ways that mental illness and in this case medications to treat mental illness can in some instances cause and make it more difficult to engage in any sort of regular exercise. And then when it comes to diet, we've seen in many different correlational studies or cross-sectional studies that People with serious mental illness have lower intake of fruits, lower intake of vegetables, higher intake of ultra-processed foods, all of which can contribute to poorer health outcomes like those big three, the cancer, the cardiovascular disease, and the diabetes. And one way this might occur is people with serious mental illness are more likely to live in poorer areas or uh, lower socioeconomic areas. And what you find in those areas often is more food insecurity. So less food security, meaning less access to fresh food and vegetables. But also what you find is a higher concentration and density of fast food restaurants. Here in Sydney, we have something called the Red Rooster Line, where you can almost draw a line through eastern and western Sydney. And in western Sydney, where you get lower socioeconomic suburbs, poorer areas, there's a much higher density of your McDonald's, your Red Roosters, your KFCs, your takeout, your fast food restaurants compared to in the higher socioeconomic areas. And it's the lower SES areas where you're exposed to all this fast food, where you have less access to fresh food, fresh fruits and vegetables that you find more people with serious mental illness living. And This can make accessibility to fresh food, to healthy food, which is correlated with some of those better health outcomes, much more difficult. Another contributing lifestyle factor is the rates of substance use amongst people with serious mental illness. So substance use, things like illicit drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, much higher amongst people with serious mental illness than the general population. Here in Australia, people with mental illness account disproportionately for all these cigarettes smoked. They make up approximately 50% of the cigarettes smoked here in Australia, yet make up much less than 50% of the actual population. And when we look at trends in recent years, in the past 20 years or so, we see that levels of cigarettes smoked have declined in the general population, but have remained roughly the same amongst people in, in or who have rather, mental illness. 
So again, there's that disproportionate consumption of substance use, obviously, which can contribute in when taken in high dosages in particular to cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, those B3 drivers of premature mortality in people with serious mental illness. So there's a lot of different factors that contribute to this mortality gap scandal. We've covered some of the lifestyle factors and there are other factors as well, but for the sake of brevity, we're only going to cover one more of these contributing factors, but it's a really important and really surprising one when I first came across this. And this is the concept of diagnostic overshadowing. This is a concept that uh, Oscar Letterman shared with me on an episode of the podcast a few months ago. And the idea here is, is diagnostic overshadowing is a diagnostic clinical error from the healthcare practitioner seeing someone with a mental illness who misattributes or mistakenly attributes a physical symptom to a result of their mental illness. So for example, someone who's having an asthma attack and presents to an emergency department, but has their symptoms dismissed as the result of a panic attack or someone having chest pain and whose symptoms are mistakenly attributed to anxiety. And there's no doubt that there is a relationship between psychological symptoms and physical symptoms in many instances. However, much of the literature does support that this is often mistakes. And what happens is healthcare practitioners see a history of mental illness in someone and it becomes this quote red flag on the file where that clouds their judgment and they dismiss many of the physical symptoms that are happening and the causality of it as something purely as a manifestation of their mental illness and when I say manifestation I don't mean necessarily that they're making it up although that is sometimes the instance and is sometimes the case but often it's just an error on the healthcare practitioner's part, misattributing it to their mental illness. So I'm going to read a little quote here, which I think really sums it up. This is from a particular study, Sheffer et al. 2014, which I think helps color in this picture of diagnostic overshadowing and how this can really cause and play a part in that mortality gap scandal. So this quote is from a psychiatric nurse who witnessed this event and says, we had a man who was behaviorally disturbed and he was just screaming out in pain, and they all thought he was psychotic. And I said, what's wrong? And I looked down at his foot, and it was really, really swollen, and nobody, apparently, he had an accident and fractured his foot. Nobody had spotted it, so they just referred him straight to me. They'd medically cleared him, and I'm a general nurse, so I said, hang on a minute, something's not right with his foot. And they x-rayed it, and it was completely shattered to bits. And there's a number of reasons that this might occur. Much of the literature suggests that this occurs commonly in emergency departments. And you can imagine if, well, at least here in Australia, our emergency departments are very often packed, busy, under-resourced. Healthcare practitioners, nurses, doctors, administrative staff are doing their best, but they're under a lot of strain, a lot of stress, a lot of pressure, dealing with different people, with not many people or not many staff able to look after so many patients. And this can cause diagnostic errors like in diagnostic overshadowing. So if we come back to the mortality gap and how this might lead to premature mortality, unfortunately, this leads to people with mental illness feeling dismissed and validated and thus less likely to go back and present to the primary care physician, to the emergency department that they saw and they went to and they felt dismissed and didn't have their concerns about their physical ailment heard or properly screened for. So then the next time something pops up physically, which may need attention, which may need some sort of early intervention or preventative screening, this can lead to them not engaging in that and thus delaying treatment. So we have this really unfortunate reality where people with serious mental illness are dying much earlier than the general population, decades earlier, which needs fixing. And it begs the question, well, what can we do about it? What is the solution? And one of the solutions, one of potentially many, is the use and implementation of lifestyle behaviors in mental health care for people with serious mental illness. So that is 
using exercise, using diet, engaging in substance use, treatment to minimize the use of cigarettes, drugs, alcohol at unhealthy dosages to help improve the lifestyle behaviors and thus improve the physical health of these people so they don't die as early. And this works really well because exercise for treatments, for example, like depression is really, really effective with strong effect sizes, is recommended with therapy as a first line intervention in many countries now. So using it as almost a double-edged shield to protect against mental illness or treat mental illness, but also to protect against physical illness in people who have a mental illness. You get this kind of double benefit.